Um, so before, before I hand over to our speakers, I just wanted to say that I really look forward to hearing from the speakers. I think a lot of organizations are really grappling with the question of how they sort of can be um, meet the charitable obligations, be accountable as an organization um, when working in partnership, but also making sure that they don't overburden partners with um, endless due diligence requirements um, and how they can move towards more equitable partnerships. Um, I'm now passing over to our first speakers. Um, so we'll hear first from Hugh and then from Catherine. Um, Hugh and Catherine, I it would be great if you could quickly introduce yourself as you speak. Thank you, Francesca. Um, yeah, so just to introduce myself, I'm Hugh Swainson. I'm a partner within Buzzercott's charity and not-for-profit team. Uh, so we're looking at governance and partnerships uh, today. And I just want to start off by setting the scene. So looking at the, the trustee role in overseeing partnerships um, and, and some of the sort of sector backdrop at the moment, in particular, uh, the compliance aspects, because it's hard to talk about uh, partnerships uh, without looking at all of the compliance that we have to deal with in the sector and that ultimately gets uh, passed on to partner organisations. So let's start by looking at some of those trustee perspectives and I think at the moment it's, a, it's an interesting time to be a, a trustee uh, of a charity in this sector. Um, there's uh, a lot going on and ultimately trustees uh, are volunteers, they're people who've uh, usually got day jobs elsewhere and you may only have say four to six board meetings a year in which to oversee the activities of the charity, albeit with uh, potentially a number of subcommittees. Um, and there's a lot of uh, responsibilities that a trustee has to think about. So um, if you ask the Charity Commission about the responsibilities in their guidance, they'd set out uh, the legal responsibilities of a trustee and some of those are set out on the right hand side of this slide. So it's all about making sure the charity is uh, delivering its purposes for the public benefit, being accountable, managing resources responsibly uh, and all the rest of it. And so when looking at, at partnerships, um, the trustees have to think about all of these uh, responsibilities in that context. And there's also the sector context uh, co to consider. Uh, obviously, we're in a situation where in recent years there's been a lot of public scrutiny um, around the way uh, charities are working. And that public scrutiny is really only increasing because of the media environment uh, that we're all operating in. Um, and the compliance environment is getting uh, more and more. There's a bigger compliance burden all the time uh, on charities uh, operating, uh, which means that that compliance environment then uh, gets pushed on to the partner organisations that, that we're working with. But increasingly in recent years, we've seen uh, a, a bigger focus on behaviours uh, in the sector and uh, the, the way people are working, the culture of the organisation has become a, a bigger factor. So on my next slide, let's have a look at uh, some of that compliance environment in a bit more detail. So where is all this compliance coming from? Well, unfortunately, it's coming from a whole range of directions. Um, obviously, the principal regulator is the Charity Commission, so let's look at them first. Uh, the Charity Commission uh, in, in recent years has, has developed its strategy around compliance. And a lot of this is responding to more broadly in the charity sector, trying to maintain uh, public trust uh, in the sector. Uh, and as a result, the Charity Commission has uh, focused more on the policing aspect uh, of its work and, and for dealing with the kind of things that, that, that reduce trust in the sector. So we can see that coming through uh, in recent years with a serious incident reporting framework that's now required for all charities, where things like safeguarding and fraud need to be reported to the Charity Commission and the response that the Charity Commission's now having to those things um, being much more significant. But compliance comes from other places as well, particularly funders, anyone working um, with funders, particularly some of the large institutional funders will know the amount of compliance that uh, comes from, from that direction. Um, but all the time there's more, more compliance requirements come uh, emerging. So recently, for example, we've had GDPR. So all of this together puts, uh, puts together a really heavy compliance environment, which as I say, then um, really frames uh, a lot of the work uh, that's done in the relationships um, with partner organisations. Um, but it's worth just pausing for a second to think about compliance versus accountability. Um, because whilst we, we have to worry about all of this compliance and the way that we've got to do that, 
Um, it's, it's important not to forget that accountability and transparency is vital for this sector and, and accountability is, is a really important goal. So I think it's important to have your own uh, values around uh, accountability um, and transparency and how you approach that, even if a lot of it's ultimately driven uh, by the compliance requirements. So on my next slide and final slide, um, I'll just look at uh, the, the trustee perspective. So, um, so if you could just move to the next slide. Um, what I've talked about so far is all the worries, all the responsibilities that the trustees have to think about all of the compliance. So how do they actually uh, deal with that? Um, well, there's a whole number of tried and tested methods. So trustees will approve policies on safeguarding, anti-money laundering, all the rest of it um, that they'll have in place. They'll have controls such as financial policies, delegation of authority to make sure decisions get made at the right level. There'll be a lot of processes that they, they want to make sure are in the organisation, such as all the due diligence processes on partner organisations, the, the reporting and monitoring that goes on. They'll get reports from management on all these issues and be able to challenge management as to, to make sure things are happening as they should be and they can get independent verification of this so for example through internal audit to check that the things management are telling them uh, are actually happening so there's lots of uh, methods to make sure this um, the, the trustees and the charity are, are, are complying uh, but again this all, all adds really to the the compliance environment that we're operating in so Supposing you're a trustee coming into a, a charity in you that works a lot in partnerships, what kind of questions should or might the trustee uh, be asking uh, around the oversight of, of partnerships? Well, certainly I think some of the points on this slide you'd ask about, you'd say, do we have the policies in place, the controls, the due diligence processes and the checks and all the rest of it? Are all these things in place? Uh, but increasingly, uh, we also look uh, more broadly. I've talked about the sort of uh, behaviours that are becoming more important uh, in recent years uh, in the sector and getting the spotlight more. Uh, and I think it's not just having the policies. How do you know those policies uh, are put into practice uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis? So the questions we're sort of starting to ask about uh, with partnerships might be more around, you know, why, why are we uh, ha having the partnership? What's our role in the partnership? How do we ensure the right relationship within that partnership and deal with power relationships and, and make sure uh, the people work with the right values and behavior and how do we uh, ultimately how do you drive the culture uh, within an organization and when you're working you know internationally potentially across a lot of countries how do you know that that culture is being delivered correctly across a range of countries and I think there's more and more processes uh, that people are starting to see to make sure that happens in terms of focusing on things like uh, whistleblowing and making sure that people can uh, speak up uh, when things uh, do go wrong so a transparent um, uh, a culture but ultimately it's a sort of behaviors right from the top to, to uh, through the organization that makes sure that the sort of then the training and everything within the organization um, uh, exists to, to, to have an environment where uh, you, you can have uh, you can deal with the uh, the risks whether they come from safeguarding or fraud and have the right relationships um, with with partner organizations um, so as a result of this context there is a lot of new thinking in the sector and we're going to hear from three organizations about their current uh, approaches to this but first I'm going to hand over to Catherine Bisco who's going to uh, have a look at some of the perspectives that we're seeing from the sector. Thank you very much Hugh. Um, yes I'm Catherine Bisco. I'm a partner in the charity and not-for-profit team at Buzzacott. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, just briefly in the next session um, is go through uh, the results from uh, the survey uh, that we prepared um, in advance and that um, some of you have kindly uh, filled out uh, before the webinar and really we were just asking six questions uh, to try to get a view from the sector on uh, you know what some of your sort of key uh, concerns and, and focuses were around uh, partnerships and particularly those, those governance aspects that Hugh was talking about. So if, if I move now to the to the next slide and we'll be looking at the um, results uh, from the survey uh, one by one. So the first question really uh, we were trying to get an understanding by asking what is uh, most important uh, from you for working in partnership, um, you know, get an understanding of, of why partnership working really and, and what is driving that with NGOs. Um, and as you can see here, the highest uh, sort of scoring response is um, respect and trust. Um, 
but then actually quite a bit of variety in terms of the the other sort of important factors so i think really that will obviously uh depend on the type of organization that you are um and your sort of key concerns and, and ways of operating and i think we will hear more about that um in the conversation section later if we could turn now to the second uh question on my next slide so this is talking about what is your biggest governance uh, challenge in partnerships? Um, and I think here it's coming back to what Hugh was saying. We were trying to sort of uh, focus and, and sort of see if your key concerns and therefore your key focus is around the sort of the compliance uh, aspect, or is it actually around the creating openness, the transparency and the accountability? And as you can see here, actually the majority of respondents um, really did think it was, it was the latter. Also a significant percentage there, um, concerned about addressing addressing power imbalances and actually the compliance aspect really focusing on uh, due diligence is really less than 20 percent here in terms of uh, respond, respondees to this um, survey moving on um, to the next slide um, question three this talks this asks what statement best sums up your attitude towards possible duplication of partner due diligence in the sector so I think even though in the previous question, actually due diligence and compliance um, sort of scored really low, um, nevertheless, it obviously is, is key. It is uh, sort of an essential feature at the moment uh, for being able to work in partnership, being able to sort of satisfy um, you know, requirements from funders and from regulators and so on. So really with this question, we were trying to uh, sort of understand actually is there too much focus on due diligence and in particular is there duplication so are um are you having you know to sort of put partners through you know additional um requirements because of maybe different funder requirements and as you as you can see here um uh, just approaching 50% of uh, people responding to the survey did believe that there should be more sharing of uh, due diligence to reduce the burden on partners. Um, however, the other two answers are, are quite evenly split. So actually a significant proportion um, do think that it should be up to each individual NGO to do uh, sort of their own element of uh, proper due diligence. Um, whereas actually uh, also a big significant percentage thinking uh, that the sector needs to completely rethink its approach on partner due diligence. And I'm sure this is one of the aspects that we're going to hear about um, later on from the speakers. If we could move on to question four. So do the trustees or those responsible for governance receive adequate information to understand the risks associated with partnership working? Um, so I think here it's, it's pretty much sort of split down the middle almost. Uh, just over 50% uh, don't think that trustees are receiving enough information um, to sort of understand the risks, whereas actually just under 50% um, believe that they do. And sort of trying to think about what might be the reason behind this split. I mean, could it be uh, sort of the sort of risk appetite um, across the different NGOs that have answered yes and no? Um, could it be the level of sort of monitoring and compliance that's in place in, uh, you know, those NGOs that have said yes versus those that have said no? And I thought it would be interesting to know what trustees themselves would say. So for some of those NGOs that responded no, if those responses were entered by management, would trustees also uh, think that was the correct answer or would they um, believe that actually they are receiving um, enough information? So I think I think it will be um, an interesting one to explore. It's probably too complex for it to be um, a sort of a yes or no answer. So it's, it's probably one to explore um, later in conversation. And then moving on to question five, and this is asking, uh, do the requirements around partner due diligence and compliance limit our effectiveness as a sector? So again, a, a yes or no um, question. I'm slightly less close this time. So um, just over 50% actually think uh, that no, uh, due diligence doesn't limit uh, the sector's effectiveness. Um, but also approaching 50% of NGOs think that actually possibly it does. I mean, I suspect that there's probably different sort of um, levels, I guess, within those sort of yeses and nos. I imagine that most organizations at some point have felt that due diligence does limit their, their sort of way of operating. They've 
possibly not being able to work with uh, sort of the best placed local organization um, because of uh, you know failing due diligence requirements and even just simply the the sort of the cost and uh, time involved in the process but also I guess it you know everyone will have experienced the benefits it is uh, can be a key decision making tool and it can also be used I guess to support potential would-be partners to sort of bring their sort of go governance and processes up to um, sort of uh, the next level. Um, so, so I, th I think um, again, whether there's been, uh, whether there's likely to be a sort of a change in approach going going forward um, as a sector, um, this will be an interesting question um, to explore. And then the final um, question on, from the survey, um, question six: How would you sum up the sector's attitude to risk when it comes to partnerships? Um, I think this is quite a complex section. I think uh, question, sorry. I think um, you know risk is is really or could be a whole topic in itself. Um, so really, is the question uh, asking and and when people were responding, were they thinking of the sort of um, sort of overall um, organisational risk management uh, in terms um, of you know what could shut you down if you got it wrong? So linking back to what Hugh was saying earlier, uh, possibly around some of the regulator requirements, um, things like safeguarding and so on. Or is it really focusing on a sort of a more practical um, and detailed level? So the kind of detailed risk assessment that you would go through uh, before working with new partners. And should this kind of approach, you know, this process be a one size fits all um, or would it be adapted? Uh, should it be adapted uh, depending on the type of organization that you're working with, um, even, uh, you know, where the funding is coming from in, in particular um, circumstances? Or actually, should we be focusing on on the word attitude? Is that the key word in the question rather than risk? Um, so, I really, um, in terms of the responses, as you can see, um, about right <laughs> wins on this one. Um, but actually, there is a very significant forty percent of respondents that actually think. Uh, that uh, the approach of the sector is currently too risk averse. So, so I suppose this might signal uh, potential um, changes um, in approach going forward. Um, and I think uh, is something that probably uh, the three NGO speakers will, will have a lot uh, to say about. Um, so I will now hand over to Eddie um, to start the conversation. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so like uh, Catherine and Hugh, I'm, I'm a partner in the charity and not-for-profit team at Buzzer Cotton, and we've all worked with um, organisations working internationally for, for quite a long time. Uh, but what we've seen increasingly is, is changes in the both the structures of those organisations, uh, innovations such as START, who we'll be talking to in just a second, um, but also within organisations moving their own governance out into countries and some of the changes in power relationships and dynamics um, that requires and and the relationships that organizations have with with partners um, really partly reflect that there's, there's been a couple of comments from both uh, Catherine and you uh, around this not just being about compliance and I think the key difference really between working in partnership and say subcontracting or subgranting on a straightforward basis is it's not just a commercial transaction this is about working together towards a common um, purpose and, and a purpose to usually support a, a population that the partner's a lot nearer to uh, than uh, the, the NGO based in the UK. Uh, I think each of the speakers will have some interesting things to say about how their organisations have, have tried to deal with that dynamic between uh, having these responsibilities and duties uh, that are imposed by all the, all the things that Hugh talked about, but building effective uh, mechanisms uh, for delivery. And, and I think to start things off, what I'd like each um, to do as, as, as we go around is say a little bit about their organisation and, 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 and what their challenges are, um, but, but then uh, draw out some of the things that they've done uh, specifically to try and build different partnership models. So Antigone, uh, are you in there? Uh, yes, hi. Um, hi Ed, thanks a lot for uh, the introduction. Thanks to Hugh and, um, and Catherine as well. Um, so my name is Antigone, I'm the uh, governance manager of the START network um, and for those of you that don't know um, anything about it, uh, we are a membership organization so we're a network of over 50 um, local, national and international NGOs around the world um, and our mission is um, to <laughs> fundamentally change the way the humanitarian system operates which, which uh, you know sounds, sounds quite um, uh, modest I suppose. Um, and we do that through um, in in three key ways, I suppose. So, so the first way is to uh, trialing new ways of responding to crises. Um, 
but in a faster and earlier um, and more proactive way rather than uh, reactively. Um, and also informed by uh, NGO decisions uh, rather than donor priorities. Um, and the, the START Fund, which is our pooled fund, is, is an example of, of how that works. Um, but also we're, we're kind of um, working around uh, bringing innovative practices um, into, um, into the way we work. So around, um, you know, community-based innovations. But, but a key um, aspect of our work um, is also kind of the, the localization initiative. So kind of the, um, the sector-wide, I suppose, move um, of um, moving resources and decision-making closer to the front line of crises and, and, and closer to specifically national and international organizations um, in the countries affected by crises. Um, so our members, uh, we, we work through our members and our members are also an integral part of our governance. So they, they're part of our board, um, our assembly, our committees, um, and program um, level decision making. Um, and we started as a consortium hosted by Save the Children UK and have recently become independent uh, uh, registered charity in the UK. Um, so I guess in terms of the topic of today, we have wrestled with it quite a bit, especially in recent years and, and, and in many ways. Um, and especially when it comes to kind of our, our um, initiatives around localization. So I guess the, the first example is um, in, in recent years, we have decided to move towards a decentralized network of national and regional hubs. Um, so at like a, a network of network structure in which um, essentially that would mean fundamentally changing um, our governance system uh, from that of uh, you know, at the moment, I guess it's quite a traditional uh, membership organization. You know, we have one central board that holds the risk. Uh, but then what we're trying to do is move towards more of like a confederation structure where there are multiple entities that kind of share the risk and, you know, they're, they're each kind of independently governed, but also connected. Um, and I guess, you know, this is, this is quite a big uh, process that, you know, it, it kind of really brings to the, to the fore this um, sense of like having to balance meeting our obligations as a charity, which at the moment, you know, is, is kind of like relatively small um, in the UK, um, but also ensuring that we grow into um, an autonomous, um, you know, uh, a network of essentially autonomous and devolved um, entities, which make locally appropriate decisions um, independently of each other to, to the extent possible. Um, so we're still working out the structure actually. Um, but I guess one one thing that we found is that um, you know one way of of balancing compliance and and being in e uh, equitable partnerships is uh, coming up with minimum common standards that um, are upheld by everyone and uh, are agreed from the beginning of the partnership, um, and uh, making sure that they are locally and contextually appropriate, especially if you're working with uh, organizations and, and entities and networks um, around the world. Um, and, and these could be, for example, you know, a common uh, due diligence process for, for all the members uh, you know, across the hubs, um, or principles around governance and assurance. So you know, having, having um, a shared um, a minimum parameter around the composition of boards, for example, or like the, the need for a finance and audit committee, let's say. Um, um, and, and the other thing we found is that we, we, we do tend to talk about risk in kind of blanket ways, um, but we have realized that we, it's important to kind of quantify and qualify the different risks of, of a partnership. You know, no, no one's denying that working in partnership has its risks, but it's, it's important to kind of fully understand them um, and making sure that your mitigation strategies are in line with, you know, the, the scope and mission, but also the, the kind of size of the organization and are, and are proportionate. Um, but I think that the main way in which we've tried to address this, um, you know, uh, we, we, we've essentially encountered this issue as well, is in our due diligence uh, system. So as a membership organization, obviously, we have to um, uh, take new members through a process of due diligence. Um, and in recent years, uh, we've, we've, um, one of our strategic priorities is to diversify the number of local and national organizations that are part of our network. So at the moment, we're quite, um, I suppose, um, uh, you know, our membership profile looks quite international NGO. Um, we have, a, we, we have um, local and national members as well, but we're trying to incentivize um, and, and, and make sure that our network can um, absorb um, a greater diversity of uh, humanitarian organizations um, and not as to the hubs 
Sorry? So would each of the hubs have its own set of relationships then with national NGOs? Exactly. So at the moment we have a global membership. So every member that joins is kind of like the, the membership is managed at the global level. So they have to be approved by our board and our assembly. Um, but as the hubs are growing, then the membership would kind of devolve to the hub level. Um, so the hubs would manage their own members essentially. But we're trying to kind of have a, a common due diligence process that is used across the board, which is um, yeah, what I'm going to um, talk a bit more about now, because I, I think, um, yeah, I think I think it's quite interesting. Um, and uh, the yeah, so 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 the idea. I mean, at the moment, our members work with local partners, but they're kind of downstream partners. So you know, we pass the funding on to the members, which we have due diligence, and then the member um, kind of has holds the risk for its downstream partners. Um, but we want to bring in local national organizations as direct, you know, um, equal members in the network. So our previous system of due diligence uh, was, was kind of like a traditional pass or fail model. So either you, either you pass all of the requirements or you don't. Um, so um, this meant that we could only accept members that meet the highest level of donor compliance, uh, which tends to exclude a lot of um, organizations that are smaller, that work in other countries, that, you know, don't necessarily have the same access to... Uh, to, to funding or, or alliances or partnerships, um, but are often the best place to respond to crises in their communities. Um, so we decided to move to a risk-based model of due diligence, and, and we've been working with our partner TechSoup on, on uh, coming up with a, a tiered um, due diligence framework. So that essentially assesses organizations within a spectrum of compliance rather than just a pass or fail. Um, so the way it works is there's uh, between one and four tiers um, so with tier one being kind of like the least compliant uh, in a way which, which you know, th they can still join the network, but they don't get any access to funding. Um, then tier two is uh, more kind of meets more of the requirements, but not all kind of that, you know, traditional donors would ask for. So then the tiers essentially um, define an organization's level of access to funds. So tier two can access funds, but not as many, not, uh, sorry, not as much as um, a tier three or four, for example. Um, and, and this is- level of compliance driven by the, the, the top level donors' yeah. expectations that you are having to pass down them. Yeah, so so to to create this framework, we we consulted with you know a lot of our donors, uh, you know not just DFID, uh, you know, but most of our donors are kind of uh, governments, but you know around mm -hmm. the world. Um, so we we consulted with donors, compliance experts, you know our, our our members and how they do due diligence. So so essentially to kind of satisfy the the donor risk appetite, we have to kind of. Um, you know, make sure that the, the, the donor feels kind of comfortable with the amount of funding that goes to these organizations that are not meeting actually their full, um, um, you know, expectations, I suppose. But then I, I think, yeah, and, 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 and I'll speak about the challenge of this a bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, but essentially what we're, what we're trying to do is, is make sure that even though their, their funding access might be different, they are still the same uh, they still have the same kind of rights in the partnership. They, they, they still feel like equitable members in the network. They have the same access to voting. They have, you know, they can still be part of the, of, of our governance. Um, so it's, we, we don't talk about tiered membership. We only talk about tiered due diligence um, so that they don't feel like second class members just because of the, you know, mm. level of compliance. Um, and I guess the biggest challenge here was uh, you know, actually convincing donors to to fund uh, those smaller tier organizations. Mm -hmm. um, because what we want to do is, you know, essentially at least start small and test and evidence our assumption that, you know, smaller doesn't mean risk here. Um, and some donors have been more willing to do this than others. So now we, we've had to create like a smaller sub pot of money that just has, you know, the, the, the funds you know, only includes funding from the kind of more risk embracing donors. Um, but the ambition is to eventually convince all of our donors to adopt this approach uh, so that like all funding could be pulled um, in one place. Um, and um, yeah, I've, I've actually not been part of these discussions myself. It's, you know, my, my colleagues working on, on the kind of uh, due diligence um, uh, framework, but uh, I, I, I've heard that it was, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard, um, but it's it's good to kind of find donors that are um, you know willing to embrace that and, and test it. 
um, especially in a network where you kind of share the risk um, already. Are um, hubs, sorry, are your regional hubs already there in a, a, a sort of tangible form or, or is that emerging at the same time? As they're the, emerging the, at the same time, yeah, yeah. So we, we're, we're, we're doing everything at once. Um, so the, 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 the members are still global, but they're kind of working, those members that are based in, in the five countries where we have the emerging mm -hmm. hubs, you know, they're kind of working in informal networks together to kind of establish um, uh, their own hub, which over time will become um, independent, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, the, the, the final kind of bit I wanted to mention about the tier due diligence framework is, is that we, alongside it, we're also developing a capacity strengthening framework, which would enable members to move up the tiers. So if you're a tier one and you want to move to tier two, there's like a, a way for you to do that. And you, you know, either peer to peer, or you know, a, a more targeted, uh, systematic kind of capacity building um, approach, I suppose. Um, but the interesting thing around this is that we're not just looking at elements of compliance, but um, we're also thinking through, you know, what makes a strong institution, you know, more broadly, um, and not assuming that big NGOs have a superior role in this relationship just because they have kind of more traditionally compliant um, you know processes and, and uh, systems but yeah so if you're looking at what makes a strong institution and, and obviously compliance is one side uh, but not the whole story um, you're also looking at what others can bring to the table at the same time so for example you know a, a local uh, organization that's you know smaller potentially and might need support to develop certain policies um, but they might also be able to demonstrate um, you know they might have like a better um, system of being accountable to communities when they deliver work so that's something that they can um, share and that other INGOs can learn from so so this is again another thing that's being developed at the same time um, but uh, yeah I guess that's kind of uh, everything from me sorry if I've taken more time than I should have Perfect amount of time, thank you. Um, and, and it sounds really intriguing then, because you're, you're building an, uh, an ecosystem, really, aren't you? With and, and there, there must be some challenge in, in keeping that. I don't know whether it is a balance. You want you want as much uh, reassurance for people as you can possibly have at the same time as having as much autonomy for everyone as you can, ra rather exactly. than exactly having to yes. buy. Yeah, exactly. And and it's it's the kind of process of trying to develop something uh, from a centralized position. Hmm. To something that's going to develop into something completely different, but also still having those uh, systems and, and attitudes in place and, and you know, drawing from, from the experience of designing, redesigning our governance to fit this new um, network of networks structure. Um, you know, we have found that it's important to to make those decisions jointly with with the future partners, making sure that whatever you develop is appropriate for them, making sure that they feel like they're part of you know, they're not just joining something that you've created, but it's kind of co-created um, with with your partners, if if it is called a partnership. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's really um, it's really kind of obviously um, challenging to balance the compliance requirements on the one hand, and the, and the need for the board to kind of have oversight of all of these things going on, but at the same time making space for um, you know partnership uh, partners to kind of feed into the process. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out then over the next uh, next few years. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll, we'll come back in the Q and A probably with a with a couple more points. Um, at this point, we'll be moving on to Angela though to tell us um, a bit about All We Can's approach to partnerships. Hi, C could you tell us a little bit about what you're what you're doing with partnerships and and, and maybe the, the the challenges that NGOs like yourself. Um, face in, in establishing those relationships. I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute. <laughs> okay, so I'm Angela. I'm a programs director at All We Can. Um, so, um, as an organization, I guess we've been around for 80 years, we, we were called the Methodist Relief and Development Fund. So we're the, the relief and development arm of um, the Methodist um, Church in Britain. Um, and about five years ago, um, maybe slightly longer, about six years ago, um, we went through a process of change. 
So part of that change was the name, but I think fundamental to the, to, to the change was um, a change in the way that we, we operate, the way that we do international development, the way that we do partnership. And um, so there, there are a number of um, critical tenants, I suppose, that characterize our partnership model. So the, the, the first one um, being that we, we became a lot more relational. We were in um, 20 countries with 50 partners, but a very small um, group, which meant that um, really for the most part, we were giving out grants, but we were not really able to follow up and actually get to know the people that were implementing programs. Um, our work was very much focused, or our partnership was very much focused on projects and, and um, so we wanted to really move um, away from, from that um, and became a lot more relational, which meant that we were visiting more, we're picking up the phone more, we were um, doing video calls um, and really getting to understand um, the partners that were uh, delivering programs. Um, I think early on we recognized that um, because we, we don't implement directly, we can't um, achieve our vision and our mission with our partners. So we really put the partners um, front and center of, um, uh, of our work. So we wanted to really get to know um, those partners at, um, uh, at a very intimate level. We um, then um, decided that what we wanted to do was to commit to those partnerships long term. So our partnership was not based on a particular program, but really um, working with um, organizations in the long term. So we um, uh, identify partners, um, um, identify potential, I suppose, in, those, in partners, the people and organizations, and then we accompany them on a journey um, of development um, for two aims. I think the first one to um, get behind their vision and their mission. Um, um, and so that meant that we don't necessarily have a sector focus. We don't say to partners, you know, we'll give you um, funds if you're doing a health program or, or, or um, um, uh, I don't know, health or uh, water or, or whatever, it's, it's, it, or education, but it's really getting behind the, the whole vision and, um, uh, and mission. And um, so we, um, yeah, and so I said, we, we partner um, long term. And so in, in getting behind the partner vision and mission, um, what we recognize is that we needed to then make sure that that mission is very clear, both to us um, as well as the partner, so that over time we can be able to look back and see just how um, much we, we've been able to move together as partners towards, um, you know, um, bringing up those solutions for, for, for the poorest. But I think the other aspect of it as well is that um, even though we do commit for 10 to 15 years, we want to make sure that after those 15 years, we um, have left enough capacity behind in that organization, that that organization is resilient enough to continue to find solutions um, to, to poverty long after all we can is gone. And so that really then shapes the way in which that, um, we, we work with, um, with, with local partners. Um, we, um, therefore, we, we develop um, MOUs, long-term MOUs with partners based on their strategies. Um, in developing those strategies, it's an opportunity for the organizations to really, um, um, I guess, interrogate and, and define issues around their own identity, their values, uh, their, um, their culture, um, and then also then the ambitions that they have over, say, a five-year period. Um, and so our grants then would be very much based on the outcomes of that strategy and then the annual plan. So what it is that they, um, they uh, want to prioritize uh, year on year. On year. Um, and so we, um, you can actually say that our, our grants are unrestricted and then partners restrict them themselves. Why? Because um, we might say to a partner, okay, this year you have, uh, we have 40,000 that's available to you. Now let us know um, what you would want to invest the money in. Um, it's, not, it's not then easy money. There's a whole process that goes into um, us reviewing what the uh, partners are, um, are, are submitting. Uh, we have our own internal peer review mechanism. But really what we, what we see is that 
everything that we are doing, whether it's asking questions, whether we are um, making recommendations, is really to help to strengthen the, the organization more. So, um, you know, if, we, if we're asking them about how they are designing a program or what, um, how they're going to, to, to measure that, all of that is really to help to strengthen that partner so that they can, they can become better at, at, uh, at, at what they do. So um, I think I suppose for us, um, the when we look at issues around compliance, whether it's safeguarding or whether we look at um, you know even due diligence in the way that we identify partners, all of that I think is working on trying to strengthen um, uh, partners um, so that we you know we, we get to that point after 10, 15 years where they are able to 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 carry on at from from a stronger base than 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 we found them. Um, and so looking at the way that we, we work with partners then, it means that our focus is on ensuring that we um, have a robust and comprehensive partner selection process. Because obviously once we have identified the partner, then we're in it for the long haul. Um, and so partners, um, um, organizations apply for partnership, not for a project. All right, and so um, we, uh, start with the uh, expressions of interest, uh, with a particular criteria, we have a long list, and then we get um, those that um, fulfill that initial criteria to then submit um, longer application forms. Um, then we work with local experts in the countries, um, we work with um, NGO umbrella bodies, um, sometimes we even bring in um, government department people who, you know, where I suppose um, in every country, local NGOs have to um, uh, apply to be registered, etc. So we include a, a, a large group of people to sort of, or, or at least um, uh, different types of people to help us to identify partners. So if, if we go into a country and we want, um, for example, to identify five partners, we might then have a short list of eight partners. Um, and then we, um, we undertake what we call validation visits. And this um, basically means that we're spending up to two days with each partner, really getting to know them quite intimately. Um, it means that we spend time with the board, we spend time with senior leadership, we might spend time alone with the leader, we might we'll spend time with um, the, um, the, the members of staff, and, and um, we'll do a number of different workshops. And it's for us to really be able to um, get to understand the, the organization um, and looking at um, a number of different things. So we're looking, for example, at um, congruence, um, you know, the vision and the mission that they have. Is that something that we could, we could get behind as, um, as an organization? Their charitable purpose, getting to, to see evidence of, you know, the values and the culture that they, um, they, they say that they have as an organization. We'll look at um, the organizational character. So we might look at leadership. Um, who is the person that's leading this organization? Are they trustworthy? Um, do they come across as being sincere, um, you know, with integrity? Are they willing and open to learn and to change and to grow? Um, are, they, um, to, are they capable? You know, do, do they have the, the, the qualifications needed? We look at governance um, when we engage with the, with, the, with the board. Are they responsive? Are they, you know, do they have the right people on there? Are they active and engaged? Um, look at staff, are staff looking, are, are they motivated? Are they involved in some decision making? What is the culture that um, binds the organization together? How do they relate with communities um, uh, as well? So we might have time for them to show us um, the communities where they're, they're, they're working. So they would have had to have a, a, a track record. So even if it's a brand new organization, uh, we, we do tend to work with quite nascent, sometimes quite small organizations. Um, but we still want um, to see that they've started to do something, um, that you know, the communities know who they are, what, what, they, uh, what they're about. Um, and in all of it, we're looking at potential. So we're not looking at an organization that's ready-made, Otherwise, then there's no, there's no need for that for, you know, there, there's no reason for them to partner with us. But we're looking at potential, potential to grow, willingness to learn. Um, and um, so then everything else that flows out of that is uh, really about building capacity. And so once, once um, the partners have been identified, we do undertake quite comprehensive due diligence because we're not going to just send money, uh, being good stewards of, of funds that we receive, 
we're not just going to send money even though we like an organization we believe that you know they um they're the right one uh, organization for us we will do a financial due, due diligence we'll do a governance um, um audit check and um if if they fail in the sense that they, they have weak processes that's not the end of it for us then it's, it's spending time over a two month or three month period whatever it takes to get the pro the um system up systems up to the point where we are able then to provide um, um funding so everything that happens whatever comes out is really an opportunity for capacity and and um uh, and, and growth for that organization so we will do the due diligence and then we will have a, a quite a comprehensive and thorough induction so this is where you know we have conversations about you know what what will partnership look like with with all we can over time what are our expectations what are expectations do they have of us and i think it, it's quite critical at that point because um this is the time that we um are, are also saying to the partners listen at, so far we're the ones that are choosing you but actually it, it's about you choosing us as well and, and being willing to um uh, to, to work with us and, and 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 actually recognizing that you know we can't fulfill our vision and mission without you and i think that's that's the point where it's, it's really about sharing the power the, part, the partner realizing actually that they have a lot of say in this in this relationship and this partnership um and actually it's 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 all it's all about it, it, whatever we do it's all about really them you know becoming better versions of themselves so that they can be able to 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 continue to um to find those uh, solutions uh for the people that we we all collectively serve which are the poorest um in in their um in their countries um we um then uh, uh, take a comprehensive organization assessment this is really for the partner so um um and that then leads into them developing a comprehensive organization development plan so um you know it, it's what are those areas that the organization are seeing need to be strengthened um so that they can they can uh, be able to um um fulfill their their vision and their mission um and then as i said before the development of that strategy and that is that is really the um what what we then get get behind over a five year period so over the, the 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 um the lifetime of our partnership you know we might support partners to develop three three um strategies um and in each of those we're wanting to start to see um growth and change and that the, the, the partner is moving towards um their own resilience so they they're, they're able to um identify additional um funders and um you know they're looking at financial sustainability we're looking at strengthening leadership and um uh, and governance so um i, I guess in a nutshell <laughs> that, that is the approach okay. that, that we um but that we take um we put a lot of emphasis into identifying um the partners and then everything else sort of um, is about how we can support that partner, um, whether it's due diligence or compliance or, or, or whatever, mm. strengthening them. Um, we do annual audits, again, a tool that we see for capacity building of the partner. Um, how are they taking on board those recommendations? How are they strengthening their systems based on, 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 on their outcomes and their findings? Thank you. That's uh, so interesting. And, and the, 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 the key to all of that, I think, um, and, and you, you mentioned um, that, that you, you, you fundraise rather than you're, you're funded by donors, is, is that you're in complete control of how you manage the relationships and you've made the choice to move to a relational model rather than a, a sort of just pass the funds down model. Exactly. I think um, in Hugh's presentation, you were sort of talking about, um, you know, some of the compliance I know funders are a big a big one in terms of us ex certain expectation mm -hmm. but you know obviously charities commission is you know the, really the ones that we having yeah. to show that we, we satisfy so around safeguarding for example issues around fraud etc which we have to do just like any other organization um, but for us I suppose um, so there have been situations where um, you know we've received uh, an audit report and it shows as if money has been misspent um i suppose for us that's that does not mean automatically we say we're not going to work with that organization mm -hmm. we want to see what is the board doing about it what is the leaders doing about it um are they sweeping things under the carpet or are they actually dealing with the situation and are they being honest and open and um can we trust that they're going to take the right decisions 
Um, and it's only if those things, uh, we're not seeing evidence of those things that we then might um, um, exit prematurely. But otherwise, um, for us, it's the, the relationship is, is, is really important. And yes, making sure that we are compliant, that uh, you know, we do what is expected, but at the same time, giving people opportunity to learn and to grow and to fail and to learn from those failures um, as well over a long period of time. And support was a was a huge element of that. You you, you did just mention in there because the the thing that's been I've, I've been wondering is if you, you, your very relational approach and and you identify leaders and and often organisations are a bit vulnerable to maybe a change in leaders or a change in people's attitudes. If if, if you do need to exit, how how do you manage that one? Because that that can be misperceived in the community sometimes. Yeah, um, so if we need to exit prematurely, um, I think what we, what we have said to um, any organization is that we will give a period of, of, of two years for exit. Um, and so what we're wanting is, so if, even if the decision has been made, okay, the leader has changed, uh, we don't think that there's any there's congruence in the vision anymore, they want to go in a different direction that we can't get behind. Um, we still want to um, make sure that there is a, um, an exit plan in place. We want to see how that's going to affect the organization. Um, because I think the last thing that we would want is they have a new um, leader. They're taking the organization maybe in a different um, yeah. um, direction. But then our leaving means that that organization then collapses or you know, that, that, that they haven't been um, supported to make that transition. And, that it's, and especially at the community level that they're able to, to um, exit responsibly as well. Um, so that is, that is something that we do. Uh, that doesn't mean that maybe we won't come up with a situation where you know, a more abrupt exit is, is needed. We don't know, we hope that doesn't happen. Um, I think in the cases where we have had to exit prematurely, we have given a lead time of about two years to ensure that this transition that ensures that the organization continues to function after we leave. Thank you. That's, yeah, that helps manage that situation. Thank you so much. And, and we'll come back to you in the Q&A later. Um, sure. but Derek's waiting in the wings, raring to, to go right now, I believe. Yeah. Hello. Here he is. Hello. Um, Hello. So Derek, you've, you've um, been putting a lot of uh, thought into the way relationships between partners work and, and that, that partners aren't necessarily a one-way uh, traffic. So it'd be fascinating to hear your, your thoughts on how relationships between organisations could be modelled differently to achieve better outcomes. No problem. Thank you. Um, so like the other guys, I'll just start with a little bit of quick context. Uh, integrity Action like all we can really, like Angela was saying, we're an organisation that doesn't have a presence in any other country apart from the UK. So we totally rely on partners and partnerships to achieve anything. So I think from that point of view, that forced us to kind of keep thinking about how we approach this. Um, and then obviously in that position of needing partnerships, we have a fair few different types of partnerships consortia, you know, partnerships with local and national civil society organizations in the country of operation. Um, it's basically that latter model that I'll mainly be talking about where, you know, we're the lead and the organization in country, as it were, is the is sub granting. Though that model should, of course, be questioned and I will come on to that. Um, but, you know, inevitably at the moment, uh, we do find ourselves in that position either applying for a bid uh, or actually running a program in that position. So we have tried to question exactly how that works. There's kind of practical and you could say moral reasons for doing that. The practical reasons are that we actually don't feel necessarily um, that when we're in partnerships like that, that the partner that we're with necessarily feels empowered to voice their honest opinion about what's happening in the program. Uh, this is particularly an issue when things are going wrong or things are not going to plan. Um, organizations in these positions are often financially pressured and they may feel that they need to hold on to those funds and and if they don't feel empowered to actually say things are going wrong and that things should change then that's a problem for everyone really it's definitely a problem for the overall effectiveness of the program we're talking about um, so there's that but there's also a moral reason here around you know this idea of localization this idea that really should an organization like ours which is only based in the UK be the one calling the shots and making decisions. No, not really. So 
that forced us to question all of these things. So thinking about us in the position of a lead, um, as it were, there were some things that we were thinking about doing and that we've been trialing. And we're in the fairly early stages of this, so I can't give you very much kind of live experience of exactly what it's been like. We've had a little bit of feedback, but we are starting to do these things, certainly in new programs that we're applying for. And hopefully, you know, when we can get those going to do some new things in the programs when they run as well. The first of those is around due diligence. So that's been discussed already. Um, basically, we see that as having a kind of power imbalance built into it. And, you know, a lot of this issue around, you know, the partnership is, is around power and trying to make sure both organisations, all the organisations feel sufficiently empowered to say what they need to say and so on. Um, and we felt like due diligence, the typical way it's done basically comes with this um, implicit idea that, you know, we, the northern organization are, are checking that you are worthy of working with us and worthy of working with the funds that we have are trying to secure here so um we wanted to just try and flip that round a bit and say well isn't it also the right of any organization to ask well are we worthy of working with you you in a sense as a as, a, as an organization based somewhere else you're using some capital on working with us you're 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 you could say burning capital that you have with your community that you have with other stakeholders in the community in order to work with us and if we turn out to be a poor partner and abandon you much sooner than we said we would then it's very bad for you as well so i think there's good reason why organizations would want to actually do due diligence on us effectively but we still are aware of that kind of inbuilt power imbalance that exists in the sector. So we wanted to invite that. So the way we do due diligence now is to proactively send all of the documents and all of the procedures and answers and so on that we would ask them. And, and you know, we're not disputing for a minute that some form of due diligence does need to happen when a partnership happens. You know, you do need to understand the organisations that you're working with. But um, we're trying to invite questions from them. So we're sharing with them things like, you know, our governance guidelines, our safeguarding uh, approach and policies and all of that stuff. We actually also took a decision to put all of that stuff on our website. So basically it's kind of easy. We just send them a link and say, everything is here. We provide a few extra bits of information to make sure it's all up to date. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is around uh, partnership agreements. So we're, again looking back at partnership agreements that we've had they do seem very one-sided really and it's it's easy to let this creep in without even thinking about it but things like um uh, communication so you know giving permission for use of a logo or something like that um you know it, it's often just us the northern organization saying you must get our permission to use our logo but you know we never for a moment suggest that maybe we should get permission to use yours uh, and it goes beyond logos as well so uh I wrote an article for Bond, which is kind of why I'm here, and I've kind of put an example in that article that if anyone hasn't seen, they can go to. But basically, I was saying that instead of actually framing these clauses in the memorandum of understanding as, you know, integrity action will do this and the partner will do this, we just, we just group everything and say the party. So you use that term to describe ev everyone in the partnership. And then that means you're automatically not distinguishing between the two. And if you challenge yourself to do that everywhere, then basically you can't avoid being reciprocal in, in how those things are written. So, you know, we're going back to those and trying to uh, redo them where possible. There's a couple of things that I haven't mentioned in that article, though, that I'd like to mention as well, which we're trying to do. So one of those is around expertise. So partnerships between northern and southern organisations often come with this idea that we have to sort of capacity build or, or, or share expertise and indeed that sometimes is needed you know if, if an organization needs capacity in order to do something and they want that capacity and we can provide that then that's great but again could that work reciprocally actually we work with organizations who know not more about for example how to work with local government in the sort of countries we're working in we know very little about that we'd love to learn more so trying to kind of share proactively here are the things that we're good at please tell us the things that you're good at and you know we'll exchange and, and hopefully tell you if there's a gap that we have that you can fill and vice versa and so on so that's something we're thinking about doing and then the other thing is uh, we haven't done this yet but in a live program what about financial reporting and the idea that we ask them to report on their spending in great detail but if we're being accountable to each other you know surely we would share with them 
all of our spending too and so on and it does start to get a bit complicated here you've got privacy rules to deal with and so on um, but I, basically what we said at that point is that we would consult with the partner and say you know here's where we're at we're thinking about making this reciprocal what do you actually want I mean do you, are we just inundating you with information if we just barrage you with all of the spending that we've got I mean, you know, that's something that I think we do initially on a partner by partner basis so those are some measures when you know we're the lead but I did want to just raise this final point around, you know, questioning that model in itself. So this is something I did mention in that article on the Bond website, which was, um, what about Southern organisations being in the lead? Uh, it's not a completely new idea, but I think we're very interested in it because that would properly shift the power. You know, the power is largely, I think, built on where the money is. And because we're the ones who hold the money in a grant when we're the lead, then that means that the organisation partnering has to do things for us and and things that we require so if we were to flip that round what would that look like and actually that kind of looks good for an organization like integrity action because we see ourselves as a bit more of a service provider a specialist service provider in the area of sort of accountability transparency citizen feedback like that's the area we're in helping citizens to monitor and hold to account key public services that they benefit from so we kind of have some tools and approaches that we use in that, but we don't have the relationships in country to, to make that stuff work on the ground. So our role, we almost fit more naturally as a partner in that sense. And um, I've, I've seen this talked about. There's, there's a donor that some of you will know, the Hewlett Foundation. Um, there's a grant manager working there called David Sasaki, who mentioned this at a conference, and it really struck me. He basically said, um, wouldn't it be interesting if this became the model that Southern Organ organizations who are much closer to the problems the issues the, the communities are the ones getting the money and they go to northern organizations for specialist skills and capacity and tools that they need that's basically the model we exist out here in the north as you know specialists in certain things and even then eventually we would do ourselves out of that role you know hopefully by passing on those skills and so on and the reason i remember him saying this is because it got a cheer the conference he was at it really struck a chord and people were kind of whooping and cheering at this and i thought okay is that could that be a direction to go in it would take a long time obviously but um we we were interested in this so this year i think we've done three bids which are based on that we're waiting on one of them sadly two haven't come through but um it's something that we're keen to try more of where possible um i'll stop there if you have any questions anyway eddie thanks yeah that, and, and it was uh, Good to hear the, the bits I hadn't already caught up with in the article, thanks. But um, I guess the, the question that I did have was, was in, in that more reciprocal relationship, has it improved the way you work? Have, have you had actual instances where the, the sort of challenge and the feedback coming to you has, has made you up your game? Yeah, I'd say the main way in which it does is that it forced us to look back on all of our approaches and policies and so on through the eyes of another organization hmm. it's quite easy to look at that stuff just through our own eyes and think well let's just do enough to make sure that we have the the the, the policies in place and so on but when we looked at it through the eyes of an organization that would actually be working with us and thinking well is this good enough for them um i think that did make us up our game yes I, beyond that though i'd say because it's quite early days of us doing this we haven't got a whole lot of learning about how this is influencing us but hopefully in time that will come to yeah that would be it would be a good outcome and, and i guess the other the other question then on, on, on and, and sadly you said you, you haven't won one yet but in terms of getting those relationships where the southern organization bids for the funds um did what, what was it them uh, truly them that had gone to the funder to ask for the funds and, and you'd made all these organizations aware you were there or are you still slightly taking them to the funds at the moment yeah, it's a good question. I think in, in practice, it is a mixture of the two. Um, the most recent of those that we're waiting on, I think it was something that had, had been circulated in our kind of accountability sector and we both identified. Mm. And I think we had said, shall we go for this? We think you would be a great lead. Um, and so, yes, th there is an element of you know, us encouraging that, but it was very kind of happily taken on uh, by, by the partner. Okay, because I guess the question there is that the reason the northern organisations tend to get the funds is, is they're in the same sort of locality and you're a conduit for money to get to the partners eventually and it's harder for them to know what funds are available elsewhere, I guess. But, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it depends who we're talking about. Like, we work with some organisations that are, frankly, if you take country out of the equation, they're just way more credible than we are, as, as in they're bigger, they've got a longer track record, that kind of thing. You know, we're quite small. We've got 10 staff. We work with one partner organisation in Afghanistan, for example, national organisation called Integrity Watch. And they've got like 90 staff. Um, you know, their turnover may well be of the same order of ours, but I mean, they're seriously credible people. So if you take country out of the equation, it makes total sense for them to lead a grant, uh, for example, and for us to be the sub. You know, it's it almost kind of weird doing it the other way. Okay, well, I guess watch this space and, and see, it, see if it starts to, to take oh. off. Well, th thanks a lot for that. That was... Uh, a great contribution. I, I, we, we've come to the time, I think, where we were planning, Francesca, to open up for, for questions. And I think you've had some in already. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much to all of the NGO speakers. I think we heard some really great examples of what organisations can practically do. Um, we did have a few questions come in. And the first question, I think, is for Antigone, but of course, anyone can come in as well. Um, and the question is, isn't there a risk that regardless of due diligence tiers, when something goes wrong, the impact will be the same, regardless of the degree of due diligence that is being done? Antigone, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's always a risk, right? I mean, there's, there's no way to eliminate risk, um, especially, you know, when it comes to working with partners. Like, <laughs> if you want to eliminate it, you can just go and spend the money yourself. That's literally the only way. Um, but I guess it's kind of like the degree to which you're able to manage that risk um, and, you know, by uh, arguably by kind of minimizing the amount of funds uh, based on like the perceived level of risk of an organization of, of, of uh, such an incident happening, then you kind of make sure that, you know, you give them the opportunity to be part of the partnership and like you are also delivering arguably more effective aid because, I mean, again, I think there was a question around this as well. Um, I don't know if it was about this uh, specifically, but you know, th there's 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 an argument around making sure that organisations that work within communities are better placed to respond. Um, so, is the risk of a, you know a fraud case bigger than the risk of essentially delivering inappropriate uh, humanitarian aid and and responses? Um, so, I guess I would look at it that way. Um, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's fraud and safeguarding um, incidents and, and, and risks, uh, no matter how big the organization is. And, you know, we, we, we all know of, of recent examples. Um, so I think that's probably what I would say. And I guess maybe just a quick follow up on that. So if you, um, you know, if you have an organization that has been on one of the lower tiers, you know, and that you mentioned the capacity strengthening framework that you have for that, is that in your risk assessments and, and the way you manage those risks, are those organizations some that you work more closely with to manage the risk? So are they, you know, do you pay more attention to them or, you know, how do you manage that? Or, you know, do you in a, in a sense? I guess it's, it's hard to say at the moment because it's quite a new system. So, um, you know, even the tiered framework itself, we've only trialed it with 12 organizations. Um, which have only recently fully kind of completed the process. And, and in terms of the um, capacity strengthening element, that's not in place yet. So it's still kind of being, being designed. So I guess it's, it's kind of hard to say um, at the moment. Great, thank you so much Antigone. Um, we had another question um, and again, anyone can come in on those. Um, can you tell us how you support partner capacity building? So how do you ensure, um, I think that was specifically for Angela, how do you ensure your partner's vision and mission fit with your own? And how do you secure donor funding when the grants to your partners are unrestricted? Um, Actually, it's three questions, so feel free to yeah, take one, one at a time. Yeah, three in one. Okay, so um, in terms of um, building the capacity of, of partners, um, I think I mentioned that we um, support partners to do um, organization assessments. So these are self-assessments. A lot of times they have an external consultant who helps to facilitate that process. Um, we use um, sort of nine capacity areas, you know, looking at leadership, looking at um, resources, operations, etc. Um, and um, 
basically partners sort of see where where they they are um, and then they would um, develop an organization development plan usually that plan then becomes an integral part of their strategy so it might become one of their strategic pillars and it just then means that on an, on an annual basis um, we're making sure and they're making sure that they're investing so when they get there um, if we say they have 40,000 how much of that do they want to invest in their own capacity building that now there's some things that they um, as a partner can do themselves they just need maybe a budget to be able to bring people together they need the space the um, and, and time to really grapple with certain things so in, a, in, a, in an internal workshop that they can facilitate themselves. So that's, you know, uh, we, we, we facilitate that, we provide the, the, the budget and space for that. Sometimes they do need external um, consultants to help them come up and set up a policy or a process or, or, or whatever. Um, and again, that, that can something that they can budget. But we also see that the way that we, um, we relate with the partner, um, in, in the way that maybe we, um, ask questions as we're doing the peer review or you know when they do their audit so the whole just the whole process of um, being in partnership it's um, helping to, to provide opportunities for learning and growth for, um, for, for our partner obviously they challenge us in the same way that we, we challenge um, them as well so yeah so we use really multiple um, mechanisms for, for helping partners to um, uh, to, to develop capacity, including partner to partner learning. So we also provide space for them to get together um, as a country, it, it, sorry, within a, with, the, with all the other partners in that country, or in some cases, we've been given um, funding for them to go abroad to a different partner to learn. So it really, it, whatever works and whatever the partner um, sort of um, puts across, as long as we, you know, we agree, that it's 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 well uh, thought through and it's going to have the the impacts that we we hope it will. Um, so um, again, I think I mentioned um, in passing, most of our own funding is unrestricted. Um, so it means that we actually in a, quite a privileged position to be able to to work in it in a in a very different way. Um, we have um, a donor who works with us in a, in a, in a similar way, um, so that that helps uh, for that particular um, donor. But when but when we um, engage with trusts and institutions, uh, we do apply um, with the partner based on the projects that they want to implement. So a lot of the trusts and institutions are not necessarily interested in providing capacity development support, but they will. Um, be willing to provide support, for example, for, I don't know, um, uh, an enterprise development program that a partner might be uh, implementing with water um, or a, a, a smart, um, a climate smart agriculture program that they're doing. So, so there are uh, times when we would um, do that together with the partner to, to um, um, submit to a, a donor. Um, was there a third, was there another part that I haven't? Um, so I think you, you sort of touched on it around a vision and a mission and how you align those with your own and, and with your partners. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, our vision and mission is quite um, uh, clear. So we, we, we're we about um, helping um, you know, people fulfill their potential and we're about helping to um, develop these flourishing, resilient communities. So um, that that is clear and um, when we then go to um, identify partners, um, it, it's really quite broad then in terms of um, activities that they can do to respond um, in order to be able to help to um, uh, achieve the, that vision and that mission. And so basically when we identify partners, we're wanting to understand um, what the partners themselves want to do and whether we think that that would help to help fulfill the potential of, uh, of people or to, you know, come up with these flourishing and um, um, uh, resilient communities. So that, that is basically it. Um, I think the most of it then is about, you know, whether we think we can work together with the organization, whether they are willing to learn and, um, and to grow and whether they're willing to partner with us and you know, issues around values and all those things that make a relational um, uh, model work, I guess. Great, thank you so much, Angela. Um, we have a question from Jeanette, who's, uh, who is asking what global standards or frameworks can be used to support due diligence to accepted standards and to try avoid using the lead organization standard as a benchmark. 
Um, who would like to come in on that question? I wondered if Derek might have something to say about that. Uh, not a lot. I see, I'll tell you what, when you said who would come in, I thought you said Hugh would come in. <laughs> was come Apologies. To um, but no, I, I don't especially know. And think about what we do. We've sort of come up with our own idea, if you like, within the due diligence system I was talking about. Our own idea, pretty consistent with what donors are asking for, of course, but um, our own idea of what we would ask for and what we offer in, in the two way sense. So no, I'd be keen to hear if anyone else has any input on that. Um, I, I mean, I think that's the sort of holy grail in a sense, having sort of global standards that ev everyone can apply. But this is something that um, the, the sector's never achieved basically. And, and there's so many uh, different perspectives and requirements around due diligence that um, it, it is difficult to envisage uh, how it ever would. Um, so, because I think when you know the conversation we we're having earlier around, um, we, which was essentially around risk appetite, and, and you know how do you protect against going things going wrong, uh, and, and what is your appetite for risk in particular areas? And you might, you know, different organisations might have different appetite for risk uh, overall or particular areas such as safeguarding fraud or data protection uh, there'll be different attitudes the due diligence needs to needs to be framed um, around that risk appetite out there for um, some way of getting more consistency and, and, and standardization around this because there are two different funders who've got essentially the same requirements and objectives but they require entirely separate um, due diligence requirements and um, and you, you have to do the whole thing from scratch essentially even though uh, the same so there's a lot of call for more harmonization out there uh, but but I've not seen anything that, that that's really produced that harmonization at this stage Um, I had another question from Rachel and Rachel wondered if anyone has any advice on effective training of partners own oversight and boards and um, especially where boards um, don't always have the time or the appetite or the skills to review project finance reports or assess how far projects are meeting vision strategy and so on so does anyone have any um, tips for effective partner board training um, to make sure that partners can deliver effectively um, in their role as well. Who would like to take that one? Um, um, I will just have to start picking on someone. Um, but obviously, you know, if you don't, if you don't have anything, then um, um, that's absolutely fine. Angela, I just saw you come on, so I wondered if you have anything to share. Um, yeah, I think I think for us, what we're hoping to well started to do now, but um, I think watch the space and would love to actually learn from you, um, uh, Rachel, because um, what we um, have started to do now is to. When, when partner a partner is doing the financial audit, I mean, we're doing that with one of our partners from Uganda, doing a, a financial audit that also includes a, a governance audit. And the hope is that then um, in the same way that we get recommendations from an audit that we can then work through with the, with the partner, whether it's about training, whether it's about putting particular um, you know, policy or, or systems in place, we take a similar type of approach with the, with the governance. Um, and in that way, it's not just it's not just something that is coming from us, but actually they're able to say, well, an independent auditor came and did you know did this. And many times as well, we then um, work if we're not going to use that same auditor, if it's a financial audit, for example, then they um, sort of work with the the partner to strengthen those areas where they've made recommendations. So we're hoping to take that a similar type of a, of approach of engaging. Um, um, boards in 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 that way, but um, certainly these next five years we do want to focus much more on leadership and on governance. So 
Um, I've, I've shared my email address. Um, I'll, I'll be, I can share with you our partner assessment risk, um, sorry, assessment uh, worksheets. If you can then share with us how you've been doing your training of boards. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Angela. Um, I have another question um, around institutional donors and um, how can we assure that institutional donors, um, that with institutional donors, the responsibility on due diligence is not just a tick box exercise, um, but uh, you know, a highly risky exercise for those that work with local partners. Um, does anyone want to come in on that one? Hugh. Um, so I think it sort of matches with a couple of threads that we're sort of talking about earlier um, around sort of compliance versus accountability and really sort of framing what you, you know, in, internally articulating in the organisation, uh, your values around accountability and the importance of that so that we, because it is easy to, once it gets compliance in so many different directions to start seeing it as a, as a tick box exercise. So really having um, internally in the organisation articulated what you think is important around um, accountability is um, important. And then it, it sort of comes back to this thread of risks that we, we've uh, been talking about. So before entering, you know, any of these sort of uh, processes with, with partners to sort of really, uh, you know, consider consider risk and and and, and what you're trying to uh, protect against because we've already talked about things going wrong you can't protect, completely protect against that but you can manage down the risk uh, you know through some of these due diligence exercises and other measures and so it's a case of really focusing on you know what what risks you're trying to to manage and and what due diligence is going to make that the most effective which i think would help focus the mind in terms of taking it away from being a tick box exercise Great, thank you very much, Hugh. Um, I think we'll take one more question before we come to the end of the webinar. And this is sort of a broader question from Jeff and going right back to the beginning of the, um, of the webinar when Hugh and Catherine were sort of setting the scene. And the question is, mindful of the responsibilities trustees have, should they be specifically qualified and should they be offered remuneration? Um, Perhaps Catherine, Hugh or Eddie want to come in on this question. I'm happy to start off. So, I, I mean, the, the, obviously the role of the board is crucial in any uh, organisation. So this is a really important uh, question. I mean, whenever, you know, we, we unpick when things go wrong in organisation, it's the, it's the board uh, has a big influence on that. And, and it, so it's crucial that the, the right standards are being set at a board level. So that um that sort of experience of the board is really important and the way we see people addressing this is is firstly by a sort of skills review uh, on the board so to um you know regularly potentially on an annual basis assess doing a skills assessment of the board to make sure that it's um uh, still appropriate and it, it is something that needs to be done on an ongoing basis because the organization can change and its operations or the compliance requirements and you may need to bring on the new skills that you, you don't uh, have currently so making sure uh, the skills base is, is right it is is um really important um and and then the other aspect is sort of reviewing board effectiveness um so having that sort of self challenge uh, over whether you, you're actually uh, you know achieving what you need to as a board that you're you're, you're managing to manage risks outcomes whatever it is um, effectively and being self-critical and and obviously boards do you know uh, on a more uh, on a less regular basis sometimes get independent input into this so sort of governance reviews that side of things um, the charity governance code sets out um, uh, a lot of good guidance around this so if anyone's not sort of had a look at the charity governance code um, you can just google it very easy to find it's quite an easily accessible document so so well worth a, a look there but I think um, it's also about spreading those skills across the, the the right sort of subcommittees if you've got a subcommittee structure obviously you've got audit committee you want someone with that risk uh, sort of background that kind of uh, thing as well um, on the remuneration side should they be remunerated uh, I mean that's a that's a big debate really at the moment and I'll perhaps leave others to get get into that but uh, you know it's it's, uh, it's this whole concept that the 
the uh, responsibility is just continuing to increase for these volunteer trustees. So should there be remuneration for board members or perhaps the chair uh, is, is a debate point. Uh, yeah, I, I would just um, say that I might have asked a different question From Jeff about the said absolutely endorse as far as volunteer trustees are concerned, um, but but actually that the, the full time people who are already in the way charities are governed aren't put in the position of being board members, and and I think that's probably something we should be looking. at um, all the responsibility for these things. Mm. Uh, absolutely and I think um, it's also something that we were thinking about um, for one of the webinars that we have coming up in the future. I think we will leave it at, um, at this here now. Thank you everyone for your, your contributions. I think I've learned a lot definitely um, especially from sort of the NGO examples that brought the topic to life and, and um, sort of helped us think about what organizations can really do differently and, and I wanted to um, just mention as well that we would love to hear uh, um, what you thought in the chat um, and um, it's just an opportunity for you to share feedback on the webinar itself but also tell us about any other topics that you would like to hear about so um, please do take a minute or so to, to follow the link and let us know um, we have, um, I just briefly mentioned, but we have two more webinars planned um, later this year and early next year in the series on governance together with Bosacod, so do look out for those. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will share the recording of the webinar as well as the slides as well. So thank you very much. For, thank you very much for everyone um, who joined us today and um, bye everyone. <laughs>